And the idea basically comes from, essentially the story came up, I was bored one day, didn't have a whole lot to do in my office, was just sinking around, wrote a couple pages about a guy getting chased through the woods. But ultimately, the storyline through the book, um, if you look at some of the intertestamental books in the Bible, the story of Enoch is one of them. There's a really cool story in there about 200 angels who had the appearance of mankind, and they protected, they were called the watchers of, of man. And I just, I really got intrigued with that story, and I thought it was pretty neat uh, to hear and to see. And I thought, I mean, if this, if there was a group like that, and if they existed today, what story would, would come out? What would it look like, so to speak, uh, in, in time? So I thought it would be a great plot, great basis for a novel. So always been a big fan of supernatural, uh, not so much supernatural, but just spiritual warfare and just angels and demons. And, and I thought it was a really good story to wrap a, a novel around. Shadows is the story of the Avonlees. Um, the Avonlees are a fraternity of angels and the last of the watchers of men. So the book starts off, uh, attorney Zach Cooper, uh, newly divorced, and he moves back home uh, into his home, original hometown from when he was a kid. And uh, he's living down the road from his mom and dad, and he's in a white ranch all by himself. And some creepy things start to happen in his house, but then also he's an attorney. So all of his clients start going nuts. They all will say that they see this man in black out in the woods. And after they see the man in black, they lose their mind. They go crazy. Uh, he has to investigate all of their cases until finally everything starts getting heavy for him. He thinks his new neighbors across the street, this, this really weird family called the Avonlees, are, are the part of the problem. Now, uh, it turns out that the Avonlees are the last of these watchers of men. So out of all the 200 that were there, there's five left. And they look like a family. They look human. Uh, but he finds out later they're not human, that they're, in fact, angels. Um, he had thought for a while they were the reasons behind him being attacked, when in, real in reality what he discovers is that they were the ones who were keeping him from being hurt. Uh, and the story just blossoms. He meets Elizabeth Epley, who's a Fox 8 news reporter, uh, and she knows a lot about his situation. They fall in love. You have to have a love story somewhere in here, right? So, so they fall in love. But, but through the process of it, they discover that the home that he bought was actually her parents' home, that her parents were the ones that really were the reason everything went there. She was kind of spying on him, and, and it just goes from there. And then you find out the Avonlees really protect them as the story goes on. Again, the Avonlees are, are a fraternity of angels and the last of the watchers of men. I, I was really fascinated looking through a couple couple Bible passages that talk about angels always being a man dressed in white. You see in Scripture that, that an angel is always a man dressed in white. So as, as I went through and I worked on the book, I thought, man, how neat would it be uh, every scene where the Avonlees are, they have a white t-shirt on or a white Under Armour shirt on or a white blouse, uh, Ariel, the, the female Avonlee, um, she has a white blouse on her. You know, it's always some combination of white. There's a lot of color coding uh, in the book, but um, they, they are just basically angels. Uh, they look just like humans. They act like humans, but you, you see that, wow, this there's something really off about them. And I kind of wanted to play with the whole... Yeah, they're, they're angels, so they've been around humanity since the dawn of time. So one of the things I really tried to do hard with it was, if an angel could interact with human culture, how would they do that? So Haas and Cal, there's, there's a scene where there's this big, strong angel of war who can annihilate any army he ever wants. Uh, he's playing PlayStation. He's a huge Browns fan. And Cal is the Steelers fan. And so they're having this big Madden uh, Steelers-Browns game. And it's like, okay, here, here are these angels who've been around for all time and they're loving PlayStation or they're a huge fight fan or a huge Browns fan or whatever. Uh, Azair, one of the other Avonlees, uh, he's a huge literature guy and he's an academic nut. So if he has all the humanity and all the time, he gets a degree from one Ivy League and he goes to another school, gets a degree from another Ivy League. And then you have Ariel, the, the female angel, who loves Victorian houses and, and just sweet culture and all Renaissance type art. And in the book, uh, as we tell her backstory, that she really helped Michelangelo paint the Sistine Chapel and just how would an angel interact with human culture? And I really tried to, to capture that throughout uh, the, the book. It was fun. Zach Cooper, um, divorced, newly divorced, uh, really wanted to go about the book saying, this guy is broken. Like you, you start the story off, and you just see he's he's very broken. But uh, throughout the story, he meets Elizabeth Epley, who who is our next character in that. And there's a rhyme that I'm going with with this. And throughout the Shadows Saga, which means Beyond Shadows One and the second book and beyond, is is a story of Zachariah and Elizabeth. Uh, they meet, they have a baby later on, and, and this is the plot of book two. No spoilers, but book two, and then on into book three, where they have a baby. His name is John. 
Zechariah, the priest, the, the man of the law. In Shadows, he's a lawyer, Elizabeth. Okay, so, so they have this baby, very, very important character, their baby as time goes on. But <clears throat> Zach starts off completely broken. But then as the story goes on, one of the things that you find about Zach is he, he definitely realizes that while there's more to the Avonlea's than what he had originally seen, he realizes there's much more to himself and his own family than what he knew. And Zach continually builds strength and confidence as he discovers that God has great purpose in him as he develops through the story as well. And the same with Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth Epley, uh, blonde girl, news reporter, but, but really her parents were the ones who built the house that Zach lived in. Um, her parents were psychiatric people who specialized in schizophrenia, and they obviously go crazy. She knew Zach bought her house. She kind of watched him from a distance, and she was trying to keep tabs of him throughout the book and the story. But then what she knows is that the Avonleys knew a lot about her family, and she's kind of using Zach and kind of using the Avonleys to get information about her family. And then the truth does come out, and Zach thinks, hey, you're pretty. I'll just go ahead and stay with you anyway, and that's where that went. Newcomers Town, Ohio. Um, the very first chapter I had ever wrote on Shadows, um, oddly enough, was Man Being Chased Through the Woods. Uh, and, and this is in primitive, primitive writing stages. But I had some type of Bigfoot type thing there. My whole And, and obviously all that got scrapped because it was stupid. But um, as, I, as I wrote it, the whole reason I did that was Tuscarawas County, it's where I grew up, um, surrounded by wilderness. I mean, you, you can... Anything goes in the woods in the forest up there. I mean, you, you can have really weird stuff happen in the woods and no one would be around to witness it or see it or whatever. So if you're ever going to have a community where you have angels and demons and Nephilim, you know, half human, half angel demons coming out after people, it's going to be there in that type of environment. And, and then the other thing was the, the concept of it being called Newcomer's Town is, is new people coming through this town, and, and it's kind of a gateway community to Tuscarawas County and, and as you get into northern Ohio. But the whole idea of new characters coming in, new demonic entities coming in and threatening this town, but also just what weird things can happen in a small town. Um, what what odd things can, can go down within a small town like that, and you always hear weird, creepy stories about small towns. And I just thought, there's enough weird, odd legends down there in, in Tuscarawas County, spook stories, ghost stories. It just, the, it really fit to have it there as opposed to anywhere else. Plus, it was really easy to research because I already knew the area. It was number one on Amazon Kindle, uh, March of 2012. Um, I hadn't checked it. I, I hadn't done anything with it for a long time, actually. I just kind of figured... Hey, it was neat. You wrote a book, whatever. And I went on to, uh, you can check on Amazon Kindle and see how many sales you have. And you can look at your page and see its ranking and its genre. And I, I hadn't done anything with it for months, probably about four months. And I went on, I looked, and sure enough, it, it was ranked number 70 uh, in, in its genre. And that was with no marketing or anything. I thought, wow, that's really cool. Uh, within Christian fiction, science fiction, or science fiction and fantasy Christian literature. And I looked in there and I thought, Wow, I haven't done anything with this. I mean, what if I just took like a week and just played around with it? And Shanna had done marketing and sales for, for her old job. And we, we played around with it. Within a couple of days, it was up to number 20. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is great. My, my book is number 20 on Amazon Kindle. Like, this is wonderful. A couple of days later, it was in the top 10. I thought, oh my gosh, this is awesome. It can't get any better than this. Goes up to where it's in the top four. And then I started to think to take screenshots of it. And then it goes up to number two, and then finally it hits number one. It was midnight on Saturday when I saw it was number one. It held the spot for like an hour. And then the next day at church, you know, people had noticed or were saying stuff to me. Uh, I thought that was it, and then it ended up holding the top spot for about a week, uh, about five days after that. But what the, the favorite thing that I have is I have a picture of a screenshot where my book outsold Tim LaHaye and the Left Behind series, at least for five days. And, and then, uh, you know, resources to market it and everything kind of dried up. But... No, it was just neat to see your book and then the greatest Christian fiction book of all time as number two below your book. That, that was just something I thought was really cool to see. Haas Avonlea is my favorite character ever. I like him more than Superman or Batman or whatever. And if you're kind of a comic book nerd or whatever, you're going to really like Haas Avonlea. Is the, the idea is within the Avonleas, if there are a group of 200, there are four who are so powerful that they really just rank a, a whole other level up. Within those four, Haas is the number one. 
Haas is, uh, and I did get the inspiration from Haas of the uh, of the Cartwrights, so so I did get the idea from him. In the first versions that I wrote of Haas, he was kind of fat. I scrapped that, made him muscular. But Haas is just kind of that angel of war, soldier of war, loves all things war, loves a good fight, uh, loves anything that really could, uh, oh, that really could just be a bruiser type personality. He's just a crude, funny, sarcastic, witty guy. Uh, he's that smart aleck guy where whenever you're in a situation, if somebody has to say that stupid smart aleck comment, it's going to be Haas because he's a brute and he just doesn't care what people think. Um, but at the end, you, you see a little bit of an intellectual side of Haas throughout the book, but he tries to hide it because it's just cooler to look tough. But uh, Haas is just, I, I absolutely love Haas's character. He was the most fun to, to work with and write. Icon Avonlea is Haas's brother. So Icon is basically another type of Haas, just not quite as powerful. But in the book, um, Icon is, is one of the Avonleys who actually fell away. And as you read the book, one of the things you discover is Icon is the reason the Avonleys have went from 200 to 5. Is he, uh, Lucifer entices Icon away from the Avonleys at the turn of the 1900s. <laughs> Before that, Icon and Haas fought together to wipe out world armies. So in the book, it talks about Icon and Haas versus the Roman army or versus the Vikings or versus whomever, uh, and the Persians. And they're very, very powerful and very, very um, just deadly um, to, to fight. But then as close as brothers as they were, Icon uh, thought, hey, I have all this power, I have all this pride, why do I want to waste this protecting humans when I can do something for myself? And he defects from the Avonlees, and then he just goes by and one by one kills all the other Avonlees where it's just the five remaining. Um, and then in the book, he comes back um, with the man in black, and then they basically try to overthrow the Avonlees uh, to take over the world. you got to have a global domination plot somewhere in a book. Logos Avonlea starts off the book. He, he, we see him first as Lucas Avonlea, um, and he's trying to be the covert. Uh, that's his kind of I'm covering my identity type of thing. But Logos is the general of the fraternity. He is your your aged, wise angel who is he oversees all the Avonlea. So Haas Avonlea even has to listen to Logos, and Logos is a very rugged, very rough. Uh, tough-looking old man, and he is uh, he's just the one that they all respect. He's the wise one. He's patient. He's very steady with his decisions, but he is the general of the fraternity of angels. So typically you see Logos as kind of the mouthpiece of all the things. When things need explained and, and the, Zach discovers that these guys aren't his weird neighbors, they're actually this family of angels, Logos is the one who does all the explanation, who does all the talk, and kind of reveals to him and teaches along the way. Azair Avonlea is uh, actually it's my son's middle name now because my wife liked the book and wanted to change, literally have his middle name Azair, so Cohen Azair Littleton. But, uh, and then our, Kira, our youngest, is Kira Avonlea. It's a big theme in our family. But anyway, um, Azair is kind of the responsible big brother type. He, he's short in the film. He's the angel of fire, or not in the film, but in the book. Uh, one day it'll be a movie. I'm confident of it. Uh, just got to get the right person to see it. But uh, Azair is the, the angel of fire, so he's a redhead in the book. He's the academic nerd of the group. But Azair is just kind of that, I've been the responsible big brother type all my life. Haas will do the Haas antics and be kind of the brute jock of the group, and Azair will get annoyed with him and be the big brother and try to be the leader. And in Logos' absence, when Logos has to go away, Azair will kind of be the one who takes over that spot. And he's just that good, faithful, big brother type. Ariel, I love Ariel. Ariel is a, a redhead girl. Um, she's got the gift of healing, so she is an angel of healing. So she can take whatever situation and heal anything, and she also can pull the men in black mind flash thing where she, they want you to you witness the Avonlea's and you now know they exist. Ariel can blink at you, and you're going to forget you met them. But Ariel is just this innocent uh, redhead girl. Um, she's the little sister of Haas. And basically, uh, she gets very annoyed with him. But you see at the end of the book where she's cute, she's innocent, she's just this sweet little girl. But then she fights with this pink katana blade and just can really be really as tough as Haas in battle. And it's just something you don't expect coming from this cute, dainty little redhead uh, girl. But yeah, Ariel was a very fun character to, to write. And you see a lot of great stuff out of Ariel in the sequel as well. Cal would be, uh, he's the tall, slender one, but he's Haas' little brother. And, and essentially, Cal Avonlea is the goofy one with Haas, where Haas is the big brute. I can do pretty much whatever I want because I'm just the big physical one in the group. Uh, Cal is the one who rides his coattails. So Cal is the speed one. 
Uh, in the book, they order a pizza, and they want a pizza from New York, so Cal runs to New York and back in six minutes and gets their pizza. Um, he goes to, New to McDonald's and plays tricks on people with the cash register. He's just this humorous little guy, but he's fast. He's very, very fast, and but he's, he's Haas's sidekick. And uh, tragic things happen to Cal's character in the book, but uh, we do see him in the sequel as well, so I'll at least throw that out there. The Man in Black is basically, everybody has a story of, I looked over my shoulder and I thought I saw somebody standing there, or, you know, so-and-so one night was sleeping in bed and they looked at the end of their bed and they thought they saw somebody there. And it's just that that capturing fear type person. Is this, is this a shadow person or whatever? But uh, in the book, there was a Man in Black and everybody spots him at the beginning. The second they see the Man in Black or our encounter with the Man in Black, they, they go through and they have... Uh, fits of schizophrenia where they, they start hearing voices and then they speak a different language that they have no idea what's going on and uh, the man in black always shows up in these places but as the book unrolls you find out that this is definitely a fallen angel he is very much after the Avonlea's he wants Zach's house uh, there are reasons he wants Zach's house in that specific area and we find out that this is a fallen archangel known as Constantine, and he's just kind of that evil one, and him and Icon kind of war for the number one demon type thing to overthrow. They use each other to overthrow the Avonlea's, which you can't overthrow the Avonlea's. And what's next for the Avonlea saga? Um, book two is all done. Just waiting to get that thing edited and, and published and put out. Um, book three is underway. Uh, hopefully the goal is it'll be a four book series, but uh, book three is well underway and into that storyline. But uh, very excited. We're re we're repackaging Shadows One. We're adding some new chapters to it. Uh, we're putting out a new Shadows with a new chapter, repackaging everything, uh, and we're going to re-release it in 2015. Uh, taking it to New York City in May, which is going to be a really really neat thing to see. Uh, scared to death to be able to take this thing to New York City. I mean, it started as a joke. And then it got from much more to a joke than now to where we're at is, is you know, a, an idea that you had is now being represented literally in New York City. Uh, and it's going to be kind of a feature thing. We're going to do a three-day event there. It's going to be cool. But uh, beyond that, who knows? Uh, we do have somebody working on a screenplay, and it's coming together very well. So if you know anybody to sell that screenplay to, it would be great. But uh, we have that together. And there's a lot of really, really cool stuff. Uh, coming together for it. So Shadows 1 did very well. Uh, I've added, I think, four chapters to it uh, from, from what went number one. So the book that went number one, uh, we've added some stuff to it and, and done some work to it to now re-release it. And uh, we'll see where that goes. And then I think when Shadows 2 comes out, I think people are really going to like uh, where that goes. So I'm excited. I write to entertain myself. <laughs> I, I, I figure, you know what, you can spend your time watching a movie, you can spend your time reading somebody else's book, or you can make one up on your own. You, you, you know, are you, Am I going to sit here and let somebody else entertain me, or am I going to think up uh, a cool idea that everybody else is going to want to have and be a part of? And I just really thought, you know what, if I could if I could capture something, I'm a huge fan of the Avengers and the comic book stuff, or you, know, then you have the spook side of everything too, but I thought, if you could capture you know, a really good story and put it out there because I, I want two things to, to happen with Shadows as a saga. I want to entertain people, but I want to make people think. I want them to walk away scratching their head and asking what truly is reality. And I really hope to prove those things as, as the book unfolds. But I, I do, I, I very much enjoy just the whole, I just want to entertain people. So writing should be something that people are captivated in and love and, and to be part of it. And one of the things that, you know, as I continued to write it, I really only ever thought family, maybe a couple friends might read this thing and, and that would be it. But the feedback I was getting for this was getting out of control. Like, I would have people stop me in a store who I have no idea who they were. And, oh my gosh, I really like that book. Or I would be getting phone calls from people who'd be, you know, an hour or two away and they'd be sitting at a Wendy's and they'd hear somebody right beside them at the table talking about this book they read that was really awesome. And, they would hear the name like, oh, I think the guy's name was, was Shadow, isn't it, by, by Trevor Littleton or whoever. And I would go to a car dealership to buy, you know, get a car. And they're like, oh, you're the guy who wrote that book. I'm like, it, it, those, those are weird things that I didn't know how to control. The weirdest thing for me was whenever I saw sales reports that it had sold in Ireland, it had sold in France, and it had sold in England. And I'm sitting here thinking, good glory, this thing is people in Ireland are reading this book in France like like that just that blows my mind I, I cannot comprehend that um, evidently they read English but whatever but uh, I just it, it, it blew my mind to see that there are even sales like overseas and, and this thing is getting some momentum 
that it just hearing that feedback and getting it that was strange that was really weird to see that and to get that quiet quiet room and headphones I, I have my headphones I, I use them all the time and I'll sit back I'll fire it up and just start writing um, I'm I'm notorious for writing and scrapping um, I actually wrote a full 400 page version of shadows before the one that's currently in existence um, got the whole thing done I think it was like 420 pages didn't like it, never published it, never did anything with it. Rewrote literally the whole book from opening day to close. And I think it I think it came out at like 460-some pages. Uh, complete rewrite. Uh, Shadows 2, I got 100 pages into it. Didn't like it. Scrapped that, rewrote that. And, and now again, uh, very much like it. I think it came out about 480 pages is where it is now. I'll probably cut some back. But uh, no, that's, that's just me. But I... I get behind the computer and just just go, but I gotta have I gotta have the headphones on. You can't write without the headphones to block everything out. And my kitty, I love I love to write with my kitty on my lap. So the the cat's got to be there. I I want them to be aware that there is a reality and a battle uh, of spiritual warfare that is happening all around. Something that we do need to be ready for and cognizant of, but know that there is more to life than what you see. And, and as you put the book down, you have to realize that there is a lot going on around you that you may or may not notice. Um, that needs to be considered and needs to be taken very seriously. Stand up.